All righty. Well, welcome to our four-part series. You are. Um, we're going to delve into the complex world of mergers and acquisitions from various angles. Our goal is to provide you with insights that lead to actionable steps you can take in your business. And you'll hear from this very distinguished panel of guests on strategies for success, challenges they focus, and opportunities that are arising out of the M&A world right now. But let me introduce myself so that you know who I am. I am the I am the moderator for today. My name is Rebecca Stewart. I'm a business development manager with Prestige PEO. Um, I've been in the PEO world working with business owners for almost 20 years. And then when I hit 20 years, I'm just going to say 20 years from then on out. Um, I have been. Uh, I tend to be very analytical, so most of my client base and the people I talk to are in the middle market arena or approaching that size. So you will find that on today we have um, a a group of very distinguished panelists in this in the Northern Virginia market and New York market actually that are going to help us with some some questions that I continually hear right now from our from from a client base and and people that I'm meeting with every day. What's interesting to me and what led to this is that. I'm hearing the same questions I've been hearing for 20 years about M&A, but the answers seem to be a little bit different today. And so our panelists are gonna talk about the same type of questions that you've heard, but you're gonna hear a little different and I, I believe in a lot of the answers that are coming out. Um, today is more of an overview of what we're gonna be doing on the next three panels. So the next three panels, we're gonna dive pretty deep into some of these topics, but today we're gonna to do an overview of M&A. We're gonna actually focus on um, three key, key areas and two of these everybody loves to talk about and the third one everybody tries to avoid when you're in M&A. So the first one is do we grow and also do we sell? The third, the third one in here which most people don't like to talk about especially our panelists is do we keep everything the same? Do we maintain? And that's not a word that a lot of people like to talk about. So we will address it today but the main focus of, of our uh, Four part series is on the grow portion and how and how are how do we stop some of the the issues that occur in m a that make us have to slow down um, and so we'll also discuss that but some of the questions that we frequently hear how rapidly do we need to grow to stay ahead of the curve here's some of the questions how much can we do with our existing team what's the best way to get where we want to go faster do we build or buy that's, that's probably one of the main questions. What's the best way to make more money? Or both, how do we make more money and grow faster? Some of the, the, the one question I'm getting a lot right now is, is it better to have higher revenues or higher profits? And then I've interviewed quite a few, up to about 20 different CEOs for today's panel series. And one of the three things that came out during the interviews that I'm gonna throw at our panelists today to hear is um, I heard a lot, and I'm just going to sum this up. Culture is the evil in acquisition land. That's a quote. <laughs> and so there were questions about how do we create a plan? Um, how do I identify the right strategy? And my absolute all-time favorite comment that that I that I received, and I think is the theme for the next four the, the, these four panels is how do we stop the madness? So, and I just love that because it's exactly where business owners are today, especially if they've done an acquisition and they're trying to do their second acquisition or they're ready to sell. How do I stop this madness? How do we prevent the madness in the future? So this group of panelists, and I see Sharon is laughing because it is so true, is it not, Sharon? <laughs> uh, it's very true, uh, but it also indicates that that is a business owner that needs to have a really good secondary team supporting them. Um, so the first question is, is it a sellable company? And if the madness is so overwhelming for the owner, then the question is, can the buyer actually come in and change that? So the madness is a, an interesting question that raises a bigger issue. So I'm gonna ask all the panelists, can we agree that our main theme for the next four series is, how do we prevent the madness and how do we stop it? Because I thought that was just, Absolutely on point for where we are in this world today in the M&A world. Mm -hmm. Love it. Good. All right. So today we kick off our panel series with the discussion strategic decisions, grow, maintain or sell. So let's start with grow. And as I do this, I'm going to read um, each of our, our, 
our panelists their bio and then ask them the question. The question I'm throwing out to you is, can you tell me about your growth strategy? Just give us an idea of where you've been with this so our, our wonderful participants, our attendees can understand where you're coming from with your answers. And how have you used M&A in your strategy? And I'm going to start with Robin and read to you her bio. Um, and it's, it's quite impressive. So I have gotten to know Robin over the last year. Robin um, joined Prestige PEO as its Chief Operating Officer in March of 2023. Prestige is a privately equity-backed professional employer organization with over 35,000 employees nationwide. As prestigious COO, Robin leads all aspects of operations, including service delivery, human resources, compliance, implementation, and M&A. Robin joined Prestige after serving as Chief Legal Officer of Gale Healthcare Solutions, a private equity-backed staffing platform with over 50,000 employees nationwide. In this role, she designed and implemented critical HR, legal, and technology infrastructure to scale the company during an unprecedented growth phase. Boy, we want to hone in on that. So scaling a company after unprecedented growth is pretty tough to do. Um, simultaneously, she led M&A efforts as Gail evaluated and acquired brick and mortar staffing companies in markets across the country. Robin also spent nearly a decade with Modern Business Associates where she led 30,000 employee national PEO in roles including Chief Operating Officer, Chief Legal Officer, and member of its Board of Directors. Robin also served as Executive Vice President of the Premier Family of Companies, which included People Premier, Inc., and Community Health Solutions of America. While there, she ran multiple business units and helped lead M&A efforts, including several acquisitions and two significant sales to Fortune 500 companies. Like I said, folks, we have, all, all my panelists have a resume like this, it's incredible. So Robin, you're up. Let's talk about, can you tell us about our about your growth strategy? And if you feel more comfortable, you can talk about some of the clients that we're helping with their growth strategy and how has M&A been used in that growth strategy? All right, so I'm gonna bifurcate this into two answers because our growth strategy here at Prestige is different than our clients' growth strategy. So we've got about 1,500 clients um, nationwide, we provide back office services, um, all aspects of HR, benefits, payroll, administrative support to our clients. So those growth strategies are a little different than ours at Prestige. But with respect to Prestige, our growth strategy is both, I mean, we are a high growth company, um, private equity owned, and we've delivered, you know, just growth year over year, but we have been growing both through organic growth as well as acquisitions. So just, you know, just kind of more traditional looking at acquisitions in our space. We've done, I think, three over the past couple of years. Um, so we've, you know, added, you know, to our client count and our worksite employee count, which are two of the, you know, kind of basic me metrics in our industry. So we've added through acquisition, um, and we're in the process of fully integrating those companies um, since I've come on board. Um, so that's prestige, but then with respect to our client base, uh, we do have a number of high growth clients um, that are coming on at varying you know, stages. They could be smaller, what we would say is probably 75 or less, or they could be that kind of sweet spot that Rebecca's talking about mid-market, so 75 employees and above, um, up to even you know, a few hundred uh, clients. And we support their growth in a number of ways. We partner with our clients as they're going through diligence exercises um, with M&A transactions, um, you know, if they're looking to grow through, through mergers and acquisitions. So we can just help them with the HR planning, compliance planning, HR, um, back office support with their, you know, kind of deal evaluation and integration of their companies, but then also we customize, um, you know, really kind of different growth strategies and platforms for our clients that are either coming on board in a growth phase or coming on board at a mid-market size or, or, or are already on board and for whatever reason, whatever vertical are just undergoing, you know, a serious kind of, um, you know, growth trend. So, Rebecca, I don't know if you want me to dive deeper into either of those, but that's really, you know, both for prestige and for our book of business, what it looks like for me right now. Second question, we're going to dive into the challenges with merging those those cultures together. So be prepared. It's coming <laughs> to the hard, hardships around merging cultures together. But I'm going to cha channel over to Mark. So I, uh, Mark, if you don't mind giving everybody a wave, I'm going to read your bio. But I want to let everyone know that I've worked with Mark for, I don't know, let's just, let's just stick with 15 years, Mark. I've known you. Um, very, very. Go to, go to 10. 
So it's 10. <laughs> so Mark has been, is very active. He's, he is a Navy veteran himself. He's very active in the um, veteran community space. Um, from a professional standpoint, he is recognized by Inc. Magazine and Washington Business Journal as the number one fastest business uh, growing company in Virginia and in, in the DC area. Now, let me just tell you guys before I read the rest of this, this bio. I sat with Mark 12 to 15 years ago, and he sat there and said, there is no way, he brought his first eight employees on with me, and he said, there is absolutely no way, I'm growing past eight employees, Rebecca, so this is not gonna be a high growth company, I just wanna kinda settle down, It was he's had numerous companies, and here we are, he's fast approaching between four and 500 employees, and I kid you not, he swore to me up and down, I'm never growing past eight employees. So, <laughs> let me tell, tell them the rest of your, your bio. Results-driven small business owner and executive with more than 40 years of progressive business management, information technology, <clears throat> and technical experience. <clears throat> a certified program uh, PMP, skilled in planning and organizing all phases of project life cycle, experience in developing organizational and communication strategies, and extensive assessment of turnaround experience, strong leadership negotiation communication skills, um, he is nationally recognized subject matter expert on veteran-owned small business certifications. I know you spend a lot of time helping small business owners in the veteran community learn how to even get going in their field. Um, <clears throat> he does a lot in the, in the federal contracting and helping small businesses deal with federal contracting issues. So Mark um, Goldschmidt and Associates is, I think, the number one fastest growing company in Northern Virginia right now. This is a man who said he would never grow past eight employees. Mark, I'm just curious, I didn't ask you this earlier in our prep call, but when you had decided to not grow past eight employees, was it from pain of doing this once before and you said never again and here we are? It was early onset madness. <laughs> Uh, which has continued through there. It was uh, part of the learning of you know, some of the challenges of large employee bases, what happens, particularly in the government contracting realm, and the fact that with a small group, if you're looking at more value-added services, you can do more fun type stuff. You know, so it, it, which is gonna lead into the question, I think, of growth and what, where, how, because I, I, I think when I heard you say growth early, you had two dimensions. One is revenue and the other is profit. But as, as I take a look at that, and when you start looking at the strategies that you need at various phases, whether it be eight or going from eight to 10 to 20 to 50 and on, you're looking at different areas of growth, each of which requires a different set of questions there's interrelationships and how do we build all those. But I wanted to set those dimensions out first. Not going into a lot of detail about anyone, but you can grow in terms of capabilities. Uh, you can go in terms of capacity. Different issues, different questions. Revenue, profit, but also in terms of markets. So all of these are strategic decisions that you can make at different times and I think the other piece that's in there that will lead to some of the later conversations is sometimes it's plain damn luck that gets you past one area and into the other. And I use the definition of luck as being where preparation meets opportunity. So there's a sensitivity. It's just you can plan a lot, but if you've got the right pieces in place, you've built the right infrastructure to accommodate the different things where you think you're gonna go or you can grow, you could be ready to accept a lot more growth than eight people. And that was kind of part of it of being able to build an infrastructure. And once seeing the infrastructure was there to carry us to the next stage, it wasn't a matter of discomfort. It was, hey, this is what we can do and this is how we can go there. Perfect, thank you. And yes, we are going to dive a little bit deeper into that conversation and into that that point because I do want to talk about strategic versus tactical with you. That that's something that we've had numerous conversations about that I think our audience would appreciate. But before I go there, I'm going to introduce Susan. Um, and I have worked with Susan, maybe not as long, but I I definitely have known Susan for for quite a long time. 
Susan Kearney is a founder and um, CEO, board of director advisor, primarily in the technology education and professional services sector, including for-profit and nonprofit and social enterprises. She has worked successfully with venture and private equity investors, participated in numerous mergers and acquisitions, and managed post-merger integration from both buy and sell side. Currently, Susan, Susan is a managing director and member of the board of directors at Newport LLC, a national strategic advisory firm where she helps owners and CEOs of middle market companies. Grow, de-risk, and I love that word de-risk because risk is a whole entire section we're going to have and exit their business on their own terms. She is also a member of the Private Directors Association Board of Directors and chair of its, its um, nomination and governance committee. As a board member at MetaVent, right, Susan? Mm -hmm. um, a SaaS platform for delivering world-class virtual event experience. So Susan, I, I, you and I have had numerous, numerous events we've done around the M&A and I've always been in awe of your expertise and um, we've talked quite a bit about this subject today, and I'm hoping that you will give a little bit of insight and in how you've participated in numerous M&A deals. And would you mind giving us just an overview for the speakers, for the, the attendees today? Talk about the life cycle of a company and how you fit M&A into your client strategy. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm, after that introduction, I'm not sure what I can say will ever match it, but I'll do my very best. To do so, so um, I've had a, a long, sometimes distinguished, sometimes not a career in technology and professional services. And so I have sold companies, built companies, bought companies, been bought by companies, integrated companies. And um, so I've seen probably the, the best and the worst that you might see. And um, being thoughtful and strategic, not tactical about M&A is really vital if you're going to be successful. Um, uh, those of us who do post merger integration in particular understand that because if you've been strategic and thoughtful during the, the process, the integration, it comes more easily. Um, my clients today uh, are uh, professional services companies, including government contractors, of course, and technology companies. And so uh, when we're looking at um, mergers and acquisitions, we're really kind of bifurcating that for those companies. Because for my clients, acquisition is a growth strategy, and it depends on whether they want to add clients, add, you know, expand across markets, launch new products. Are they looking for a particular talent? That's especially true in GovCon DOD specifically. You know, depending on, on what the strategic initiative is, they may decide to grow organically, or they may go looking for an acquisition that brings that to them, a set of clients they want, or a product to fill a hole in their inventory, or specific talent, particularly in scientific and um, defense kinds of, um, of areas. And, um, and, and the decision is a very classic business school builder by decision, right? It's about how can we achieve our initiative as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible, because while you asked earlier, Rebecca, you know, which is it? Is it um, revenue growth or is it profit? You know, the world I live in, the answer is yes. <laughs> and for investors, if you don't have growth, the conversation's quite short. If you're growing nicely, then we can talk about how profitable you are, how we can make you more profitable and how we can continue to grow. So that's how we kind of fit in the acquisition side for my clients. Um, on the sell side uh, for M&A, it's really about the vision that the owner has for their business and their future business and personal and deciding when the right time is for them, for their team, for their family for them to exit to either start a new venture, retire on a boat in the Caribbean, travel the world, or do you know any of those other things that they've earned through their sweat equity. So that's a very different conversation. It's personal and it's professional, and the timing has to do with the health of their business. Um, low risk, high growth and profit um, is the equation there. Uh, their personal health, the family legacy they want to leave and community legacy and what's going on in the internal marketplace. You know, uh, today, for example, uh, markets recovering a little bit from last year, but uh, market forces have held the sell market, you know, kind of in stasis for the last 12, 18 months. So that's how I think about it. 
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're going to go to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, um, she has a very, very extinguished career. So I'm going to I'm going to summarize some of this, Elizabeth, because you've got a very long um, list of success. And currently, Elizabeth is is the um, acting executive director of Coda Support Foundation. She's doing that actually just after I think she's recovering some from some M and A and has taken this on just to be helpful. <laughs> so I honestly do. I'm on the board with her there. And when I read to you what she has done, so Elizabeth is a transformational leader with expertise in strategic planning, logistics, human capital, and information technology. She's currently focused on community service and volunteerism. And I honestly do believe that's because she is. Um, taking a little bit of a break of all the M&A and, and acquisition work she's done. She has over 20 years of diverse experience in telecommunication and um, WAN engineering, software engineering, data center and hosting management consulting, military and deployment support, logistics and humanitarian missions, higher education and federal government contracting. Prior to retiring, she was the CEO of Tricor Industries, where she reinvented the company to become an international cutting edge digital service firm until M&A and exit. During her tenure, she ex expanded revenue by winning new service contracts and brought to market two innovative C TCI software products supporting educational institutions, nonprofit organizations, and federal and state government agencies. Um, she did expand Tricor's businesses to five new states and two new international sites. She completed five successful M&A deals during her career with them. I can go on and on, but one of her, I think the things I love about her is she is um, active in her community and serves on several boards. She is currently the vice chair of the Howard University Executive Education Advisory Board. She's a trusted a trustee and interim executive director of the Code Support Foundation. She previously previously served on the Information Technology Council, appointed by former governor of VA and the VA Founda Foundation of Community College Education. So um, along with having a tremendous amount of success in the M&A world, she gives back a lot. So if anybody ever wants to reach out to her, I know she'll take every call out there. Um, Elizabeth, I'm gonna ask you the same question. So just quickly, can you give me um, what your thoughts are on growth strategy today in the marketplace and, and have you used and what what strat what M and A strategy have you used around your growth initiatives? I think you know for growing, it's all about the foundation that you establish, right? To me, it's more important for a company to achieve sustained growth than just you know grow very rapidly and shrink and and be very unstable. So I think the foundation is important, um, you know, and then of course the backlog and diverse, um, you know, how to diversify client base. For example, some small businesses or 8As, you know, have one or two uh, two customers and they have very large contracts, like three large contracts. And so, you know, in government contracting, everything has to be recompensed. Repeated and 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 unlike the old days where you know according to Gartner uh, many years ago the recompete win rate is about you know is above seventy percent now it's much lower right so it's all about diversification diversifying your portfolio understanding where your core competencies are and making sure that you do the best that you can because in uh, the bidding process only the best wins not number two right and 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 I always believe that. People are the most important asset to the business. As we start businesses, we start out, you know, a lot of us start out uh, from our garages and, and living rooms and uh, some, sometimes even bedrooms, right? Depending on uh, what, um, what we like, um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, there has to be milestones that we achieve, right? So you start small and then you make enough money to, you know, handle a new contract work because, you know, a lot of times customers don't pay you for two, three months, right? So, so the financial back backing is very important, but having the talent on your team as partners in crime um, is absolutely critical because, you know, um, people, I, I still believe that people are our most important asset and then the diversification backlog. And we can't just have, you know, two large contracts, rather have, you know, 10 mini contracts rather than two large contracts because the risk is lower. Uh, because, you know, a lot of times investors, um, not unlike the company owners, need to have consistent and increasing revenue and profit in solid contracts and strong customer base. And of course, um, we always, I, when I 
used to have a real job, you know, I always looked at uh, the market. I want to be in a market uh, where at least it's not declining and I prefer to be in a market where, you know, it's increasing, for example, cyber AI, um, things like that. If that answers your question. Absolutely. Thank you, Elizabeth. And that's, that's that actually teases right over to our next mod, our next panelist. And we have two more very distinguished panelists that we're going to talk to. And talking about people, when I think of people, people organizations, Simventions comes to mind. So if you haven't read the um, what's out there in the marketplace about Simventions and how this is a company that is absolutely focused on the their their people, um, you should. They they get very very high rankings. And Joe is the president of Simventions. I'm going to read you his his distinguished bio really quick. Um, so Joe. Joe is a U.S. Navy veteran, has over three decades of engineering management and executive leadership experience with small and large defense contractors. He is currently the president of Simventions, Inc. He has an MBA from Florida Institute of Technology and has been a certified PMP since 2006. Mr. Caleri is also an adjunct professor in the College of Business at the University of Mary Washington and is a past mem member of the um, University of Mary Washington College of Business Board of Advisors. He absolutely gives back to his community tenfold, um, a huge supporter of veterans and veteran causes, him and his organization. And Joe, I, I'd love to, I, I'm going to ask this question a little bit differently towards you because, um, because I do know you very, very well and I know, I know of your company very, pretty well. Um, so I'd, I'd like you to answer this in a little bit different. I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about, about the growth. But you made a comment to me, um, but would you give us an overview of your growth strategies and how you've changed those strategies as your company has grown? And you made a reference the other day, and this is gonna, that just, I, I like, it took me, I, like, oh my God, Joe, you had mentioned No Man's Land, which um, people who know me very well know that I'm a huge, it, it's a book called No Man's Land. It's one of my absolute all time favorite books. The author of that book, Doug Tatum, is is my men, is been one of my mentors in life. And Susan, that is her. I guess you would say your boss, right, Susan? <laughs> I guess in a, in a way, he said, he surely he thinks so. Yes. So. <laughs> so I was taken back, Joe, when you said that because I'm such a fan of No Man's Land, and you're spot on. Um, my husband's real familiar with No Man's Land, but you are so spot on with the comments that you made, and it has to do with that growth. So would you talk to us a little bit about? your experience um, with your growth strategy, how you've changed that and how you reference no man's land. Sure, yeah, thank you for being, uh, allowing me to be here. I think it's great and um, not quite as distinguished as the other speakers, but you know, our strategy having been a defense contractor going on 24 years has gone through the typical, you know, startup mom and pop to the, oh boy, we really can do this. Let's see how much we can do growth model. and. You know, for the first seven or so years, it was getting that stable footing. And Mark kind of did a good job already talking about how you go from the eight to the 80 to the 800. And, um, you know, for us, it was looking at um, taking work that we were doing for existing customers to new customers or taking existing customers work we're doing for other customers in an innovative way to them. And being able to grow at a, you know, fairly rapid rate through um, winning contracts and being brought on the teams and creating opportunity. To be honest with you, it's not just growth for growth's sake for us. And you kind of touched on it, Rebecca, and in our industry and at GovCon, it's all about the people. And so if I'm not growing my company, I'm not creating the opportunities necessary for them to grow. Um, our retention is phenomenal and it's largely driven off of our employees want to be here, but they're only going to want to be here if they have meaningful things to move on to, to get new skills, to use their gifts and talents in new ways. And so our growth model has largely been driven off of not just growing for the company's sake, and yes, as an owner of the company, and uh, right now the company's 100% ESOP, so we're all employee owners, it's important. Um, but, you know, we had major, just like every company, major decision points and milestones along the way that um, gave us the opportunity to look and see what the future is for us. And so as we're sitting about 380 employees, I'm kind of too big to be small and too small to be big. And that's no man's land to your point earlier. In our market, um, I don't have the buying power the bigs have. Uh, I don't have as much fringe opportunity as, as a lot of the bigs have, but I'm competing 
uh, day to day now with the big contractors. And that's why, you know, we've got to work our way out of uh, the 380 market into about a thousand employee market. So as our growth strategy um, initially was through organic growth, um, we're not going to stop the organic growth because we have such a great relationship with our customers, but we're now looking for geographical growth um, and into new markets uh, of, of areas and capacity that we can't support. And the easiest, quickest way to do that, uh, having been through several of them, is through M&A. And so that has changed our strategy from, you know, let's grow the company through um, mom and pop hero to let's bring on a bunch of other people who are exceptional at what they do and let's open up the full capacity of everyone in the company, uh, transfer ownership of the company from the founders to every employee. We did that three years ago, going on our fourth year as 100% ESOP. And now it's just a matter of looking for the right companies to have that explosive growth to help work us out of the no man's land. I would like to ask a question or sure. comment. A couple people mentioned, and I, I think Elizabeth and a few other people mentioned diversification. I'd like to clarify the term diversification because it can mean different things to different people. You know, like Joe mentioned, customers, and I've seen particularly in things like the 8A and other as the businesses go from emerging to small. Diversification may mean, hey, I want to do things in 15 different NAICS codes, but I think when you talk about diversification, it's always been from the comments here in the context of a sustainable company, but also a sustainable capability in whatever area you're doing business. We've got a couple of projects we picked up. We thought they might be good introductions into an agency, but they're just kind of sitting there and they take management time, management attention. And yeah, they make money, but they really distract and the opportunity cost is far greater than any kind of profit we would get from that. So if, as we look at diversification, maybe include that definition for a context to talk about what's good diversification and what's not good diversification. Mm -hmm. That kind so Mark, of goes back to um, Rebecca, you said we were going to talk about strategic versus operational and, and, and that comment goes directly to strategic acquisition, if that's your choice for growth, rather than operational. You have to think about more than maybe getting those couple contracts. You have to understand how that fits into your longer term strategy because acquisition's hard. It's hard to find the company, it's hard to vet the company, it's hard to integrate the company and the people. And there has to be a very good strategic long term reason. That, that that will give value to your business. I think, and that, and, and I'm going to turn over to Sharon here, and I know she's got probably a thousand thoughts on this right now, but I do want to ask, I know she, I do want to ask Mark one question. Going through that and realizing that now, it, it, and it gives you an experience that I think some of our attendees are probably just now getting for the first time, uh, or they're about to make an acquisition and and how do you prepare for that for the next acquisition? Have you changed the way that you're acquiring a business based on that experience? I, th I think when you have a number of unintended consequences, you start to learn that there is no such thing as an unintended consequence. It's just a matter of experience and your ability to ask the right question. So it's, yeah, I went through pure, I, mean, I don't think Sharon lived through it with me particularly, but wasn't far off. And the acquisition that I did, and it was pure hell. Because I, I started to get into all of these things of what appeared to be competing regulations or conflicting regulations. Um, new stuff that I'd never seen before. And then how do I fit that in there? And it, it's the, um, the jigsaw puzzle with every square being just kind of one color. So how do I now put that thing together and how do I figure out where the pieces fit? So the preparation is, I went through it before, I kind of rushed into it. Next time it's learning some of the questions and going to folks like you see on the panel and saying, what do I do? What do I expect? and setting up a reasonable set of expectations. And hopefully the questions come back to, well, what are you trying to grow? What are you trying to increase? What are you trying to improve? 
you know, if you want to improve your market, you want to improve your, you know, basically your value to package and sell. So within there, what are the right questions and what are the right preparations I have to do to be able to address the questions and put the things into perspective for whatever those objectives are. And I think that that leads us right into Sharon. I, I'm going to read your read your bio, but just keep thinking about stop the madness. Like that's our theme for this whole thing. So that one cut right there, Mark, just describe the madness that we're talking about. So let me let me tell you about about Sharon. Um, first off, this is the book that everyone is going to be receiving, and I have them here. And so when we're done, we'll be sending this out. Sharon had um, this is her book. She just published it. Sharon, it came. It, you published it to Forbes. And Forbes is a publisher and it came out on January 2nd. That's what I was, it just came out. So you guys are getting it hot off the press. Um, I went and confiscated 50, about 50 of these. I have enough, just enough for everybody here. So that's good um, here and our next one. So Sharon, um, known as one of the country's leading small business advocates, Sharon Eaton, founder of SB Liftoff is an avidly sought speaker and she is so the fact that she has agreed to do these series with us i feel i feel just in awe of her so that you know on small business growth strategies and MA. I founded sv liftoff says he to serve those special people who sit at their kitchen table come up with an idea start a business hire people pay their taxes and fuel our economy so our audience small business owners are the backbone of the American economy, and we are honored to make sure they get their fair deal. SB Liftoff serves commercial and government contracting companies with 10 million to 100 million in revenues and more than 2 million in EBITDA. Eaton's book, Liftoff, 12 Things to Know Before You Sell Your Company, published by Forbes, is available on Amazon, but of course you guys are all getting it. Appointed to the Small Business Administration's Investment Capital Advisory Committee, she is working with Nat. She is working nationally to increase small business access to investment capital. Leah is one of our attendees, and I'm sure she's just clapping right now. Eaton publishes in Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Washington Business Journal, and Alabama.com. I, I just have to ask where Alabama.com came from. As a Tennessee grad, I need to know that. And regional outlets and around the country. Heaton has been associated with the global law firms of uh, Skaden Arps and La Lantham Watkins and has served as senior counsel on the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs, General Counsel and Deputy Staff Director of the Senate Committee on Environmental and Public Works. She co-founded Wellford and Energy Group, an investment bank serving clean energy and low carbon companies. Previously, she was deputy counsel of a Fortune 500 company operating in 10 states. Ms. Heaton holds a Juris Doctor. Above all of that, she has her JD from the University of Chicago Law School and a BA from Bernard College. So Sharon, my question to you, and I have it, um, I wanna make sure that I, I, have the, I thought about this quite a bit because I'm hoping you can bring this question home for us. Organic versus inorganic growth. What are the pros and cons of each? And would you mind talking to us about your book and why you wrote it? Before we get into the question. Let me start off with the organic versus inorganic growth, and then I'll turn on to the book. Uh, first of all, it's a delightful panel to be here, and I've been listening to all these speakers and saying, yep, yep, completely agree here. Want to specifically go to something that Susan said, which was she gave all sorts of reasons to do acquisitions. And one of the reasons she did not give, which I actually think is a bad reason, so I totally agree with her, is simply to increase revenue. You should be buying a company because it's going to give you new people, a new market, uh, a new uh, capacity. Uh, it's going to do something in terms of opportunities for the employees, as was discussed, but not simply to say, we're a $20 million company now, and I want to be a $40 million company. That's not necessarily su a, a sufficient reason for the brain damage that an acquisition will cause you. Uh, and I, you know, I, I'm just, hey, listen, I'm an M&A advisor. I love M&A, but let's not be uh, foolish here. It's a complicated process. Um, Sharon, Sharon, I'm going to say when you talk about brain damage, you got to consider in those situations it probably is pre-existing. <laughs> <laughs> about that offline, Mark, you know. <laughs> um, so when I look at the build versus buy, uh, I often think of it as a matter of timing. Um, and also what it is you're trying to achieve. 
Um, we have seen a number of people who are experienced GovCon uh, executives who built and sold a company. And they want to get back into the game. They've waited out their non-compete and they could start another company. They could go to um, Staples and buy a yellow pad and, you know, start all over again. But the first five years of a GovCon company tend not to be fun. Uh, those are the years that you're trying to create the relationships, getting subcontracts, getting some past performance, et cetera, et cetera, before you can start even seeking prime contracts. So for somebody like that, the idea of buying versus building is, yeah, I could uh, build it, but it will take me five plus years. Alternatively, I can do it immediately and step into somebody else's shoes and build on that platform. Uh, of course, if you're going to uh, buy it, your chances are you're either putting out capital or taking on debt. Um, so there's risk associated with that. On the other hand, it is uh, that leverage that gets you to your result faster. Um, so it becomes a kind of risk reward uh, for the party. We have definitely seen uh, folks who have said, under no circumstance would I ever borrow any money, at which time I say, I'm not sure operating a business is necessarily in your best interest. Uh, that's kind of thinking like an employee, not thinking like an entrepreneur. Uh, because debt has a role used wisely, not dumb. Um, so acquisition as a growth strategy could make a lot of sense so long as you're clear for why you're doing it. You know, the kinds of reasons that Susan talked about or the employee opportunities that Joe talked about, uh, but not, don't just do it for revenue. So organic growth versus inorganic growth uh, depends upon a lot of the factors of where you are, who you are, and what you're looking to achieve. Um, as for the book, um, at SP Liftoff, about 80% of our work is done on the sell side. So we talk to sellers all the time. And after hundreds, thousands of these conversations, I began to realize that people were asking the same questions over and over again. How do I maintain confidentiality during this process? What is the process? Who will be my buyer? What is due diligence? Um, what is the valuation methodology? Are there other valuation methodologies? When should I bring my company to market? So I sat down and basically wrote these questions and the answers. And the book is written for business owners. It's not written for the lawyers and the accountants and the investment bankers. It's written for the smart person who's created their company, made it successful over a period of years, but maybe has not done more than, maybe has not done any M&A or has done one transaction that may be created a little bit of PTSD. So the idea is to try and provide information that we think is so important for sellers, but in truth, buyers to understand so that when they're going through this transaction, which is going to be very meaningful to them financially, it does not create the level of anxiety that it might otherwise create because they have more information not necessarily enough information to go out and do it themselves because, hey, listen, if I had a tooth to pull, I would go to a dentist, I wouldn't do it myself. Uh, but it's kind of nice to know what to expect when you go into the dentist's office. So that's the idea of the book, to provide in accessible terms to smart people what the M&A process is about and what are the emotional issues associated with that, that it's not simply a financial transaction, but it's more than that. Oh, that's fantastic. And I do think the emotion part is actually pays a really, really big piece in M&A. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to throw it back to everybody. We, we've talked about the difference between um, just growing your business. But but there's a topic that we all we all try to avoid, and that is the word of maintaining. But I do want to talk about this because I do see it in the marketplace right now. I mean, I see it personally. I mean, my husband, um, as all of you know, is is. Uh, has done an acquisition to grow his business. It got him into a new market. It was it was worth it, but he would tell you there was madness that went on for three years. And so the the and and we're getting there, right? He's getting there, and um, you know, so I get it. But the the one thing that that comes up that we don't like to talk about, and I think we need to, it's the elephant in the room, is is that word maintain. And so let me let me redefine that word so we're all more comfortable with it. So let's let's start there. So when we talk about, hey, I, I, you know, I'm I've done two acquisitions. I need to merge my cultures together. I need to slow down a little bit. It, that can freak out the banks. That can freak out your private equity. That can, you know, that definitely gets people going, wait a minute, what do you mean we're gonna slow down a little bit? But let's talk about it. So when, 
when we hear that word, we can use the word. I broke them all down. This is when I was doing my interviews with CEOs. These are the words that I were given. Okay, so level setting. We are at capacity. Um, we're a little brittle. I thought that was a really good one. We're a little brittle right now. So, um, and I like that. I need to stabilize. I just need to take a pause. I just need to take a pause. Take time to merge our cultures, our products. How did we know? How do we know it's not too soon for the next acquisition? And and that word PTSD, I really do believe that there are times when you've done two quicker acquisitions and you're having acquisitions and you're having difficulty getting the the cultures and the products and the there's so much going on that the executives can say, you know what, it's okay. Let's let's slow down a little bit. Then you got to convince your boards, right? And that's where I think a lot of people are right now. Um, I see it, I personally see it more, and maybe it's because when I'm brought in, I'm brought in on the HR side of things. So I'm brought in when there's pain typically going on, where you guys might see, I don't get a lot of calls where, hey, things are going great, let's talk. <laughs> so I see it, you know, <laughs> I see it when it's not going great, but you guys might see it when it is going great. So I'm, let's, my view only is, is, is not, but is not the the um, precedence here. I mean, I, but I do want to make sure that we do talk about this word. So I'm going to throw this back, and I just want to get some perspective. So let's ask ask our actual business owners on here. Tell me about your experience at when you realized you need to take a pause. And let's just be totally honest about this. This can be in the in the past, um, after you've had an acquisitions, and what steps will you take in the future to minimize that? Because what we're trying to do is if we recognize it's happened in the past and we did need to slow down because there's too much profit going out the window right now where we're bleeding, then the next time we do it, right, we can do it a little bit better in the pre-acquisition, which sets us up for our first, our next series, which is the pre-acquisition, really talking about that. So I'm gonna throw this out, I'll just pick somebody. Joe, why don't we start with you? You know, where I've seen this happen is when, um the acquirer doesn't set the right end states for what they're trying to accomplish. Like what, what is the purpose? Even if it's financial, which I'm, I'm agreeing isn't a good, good one. You've got to come up with your end states and, you know, working in an M and a is like working a proposal. It's like banging your head against the wall. It only feels good when it stops. And, and so what happens a lot of times is you get to the status quo point where it starts to feel normal and you never maximize the true vision and value that you set out to get to your end state. So I think it's just like anything in strategy, right? Everyone has a strategy to like get punched in the nose, right? Mike Tyson, famous quote, you've got to lay out a really strong strategy that everyone has to buy into as to why you're doing it. And what do you want as the end state? Because I, I don't believe in the maintaining. I, I think maintaining is a, is a, um, quick path to failure, to be honest with you, especially in my industry, if you're not growing, you're dying. And so this, the pain point that you hit as you're going through your integration is uh, very often a satisfactory, hey, we're back to normal, it feels normal again. Well, that may be true, but it's not, if you didn't lay out the right end state, you've still got a mountain to climb. And that's where most of these deals go wrong as they give up that vision. My two cents on you. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mark, what do you think? I think I recognize the need to take a break about two years ago, and I'm still waiting. <laughs> the um, in our situation, it was a little bit different, a little bit unique. We've been kind of somewhat stable with the mentor protege relationship, and then all of a sudden, we got hit with some fairly significant opportunities. Um, concurrent with that, um, we were looking at graduation and planning for graduation from 8A. Um, concurrent with that, we realized, you know, we've got to make a change to go from QuickBooks to a more robust accounting capability. So as we were going through all of this, um, it was kind of a profound growth. Uh, the, um, the other piece is when we were doing the accounting piece, we're getting ready for year end and getting ready for all of the stuff. Our accountant said, oh, I'm retiring. Here, I'm turning you over to a new group. So we had all of these pieces going all at one time. And when you talk about the confluence or convergence of all the things you ever wanted, be careful what you ask for. So we're, we're coming out of a period of 
rather significant growth, rather significant change. Um, when we acquired the company, we looked very deeply at some of the cultural aspects. In general, the company met the cultural aspects, but not all of the people did. Mm. You know, so it was a, and with that, it looked like, you know, as we were growing, we needed certain capabilities in terms of a CFO, BD, HR, in addition to all of these, including the key staff, which, oh, okay, they've got some of that, so we don't have to hire to go do that. And it just turned out to be an incompatibility in a number of different areas. It's really hard to pick up one unless, um, unless you really, it just takes time to work through to pick up what the, the differences are. I think we came up with the, uh, with a statement, you know, what's the difference between um, our company or, you know, basically between the company we were buying and yogurt? And the answer was yogurt has a living culture. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's tough to get through the yogurt test when you go do that because, hey, up until then, it's all sales. I could comment on that for a moment. One of the things that seems to happen is buyers want to go into to companies that they just acquired and kind of say, I've got a 90 day plan and I'm going to do all this stuff. And it does feel like the first thing that a buyer should do is calm down the employees. Um, you've bought this company in part because of those employees and too much change that they're not prepared for or that is done badly can be very devastating. People understand that it takes a fair amount of time to do the acquisition in the first place, to find the company, negotiate the deal, get the financing, closing it, et cetera. It takes a while to do that post-merger integration. And that post-merger integration is where value is lost. Everybody's got incredibly high expectations and then crosses the finish line by fainting over that finish line. So it might take people a little bit of time to catch their breath, uh, and then to calm down the situation so that those seller employees feel comfortable in the new world order, as opposed to immediately start sending out their resumes. They need to be communicated with as to they are valuable, their, um, their salaries are not being cut, their benefits are not being cut, and that there's a, uh, a role for them going forward. And I think that buyers are very smart to spend time on those kinds of issues that might be considered a pause, but I think if you layer one acquisition on top of another acquisition on top of another acquisition, then you might be having disgruntled information being passed from employee of uh, target one to employee of target three, and you're losing the culture that was so valuable to you in the beginning. So it's not so much maintain, but recognize that you have to have some level of absorption in order to be able to stabilize that platform before moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're back. Can, I, can I add to that? Absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. And you know what, what my experience is and all of this kind of stuff, people wanna know like on day one, when the CEO or president or sums up talking to the new organization, people don't care about all the things that we've been talking about, about all these synergies and all these geographic expansions. and they want to know, do I have a job tomorrow? Do I, you know, and so I realized, you know, when we're rolling things out, an executive team is very often accelerated through all the stages of learning, right? They're, they know the, the foundation, they know the fundamentals, they know the, all the supportive information, and we're all liquored up on why it's such a great thing, and we see the vision and all those things. Uh, leaders really got to be careful when they're communicating in that first forum to not go past the, well, what's in it for me from the employee standpoint? And that, that happens all the time. I don't know about you guys, but I, I was part of a, a small company that got bought by one of the biggest defense contractors in the world. And he came and told us, hey, we're here to change us by buying you. And I'm like, okay, that's that doesn't sound right. So you all of you just be careful of the messages you're you're rolling out and understand your employees want to know, do I have a job tomorrow? My benefits still good. All the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those lowest two levels. If you don't get those satisfied, it doesn't matter how much opportunity is being created by the merger. 
it'll, it'll be wasted. And that's where most of them go wrong. Sharon's hundred percent right. It's all in the communication. Right. It's culture and communication. In fact, Rebecca, we could have a whole one of these sessions just on post merger integration. Yeah. When does it start and how do you do it? But I wanted to circle back to um to your original question. And um, and I, I agree with Joe on this. You can pause your acquisitiveness, but you cannot pause your growth. Because the, the here's what's happening in the market is the minutes your competitor knows that you've done an acquisition. They know they've got a 12 to 18 month ramp to eat your lunch because they know you're distracted, right? And so first merger integration will help with that. But you, so you can't pause your business. You have to continue your organic growth efforts. You have to continue your post merger integration and try to get your synergies. You have to keep that eye on the market because you're in a vulnerable state for that 12 to 18 months. And pausing uh, will just leave you behind because the market's going to run ahead. They're not going to wait on you. Not only will the market run ahead, but the market will then say, oh, let's go target the uh, target the people who were employees of the company that was bought yes. because those people are destabilized at this point. So you as the buyer really need to get that communication, as Joe said, so critically important. Uh, and I think that that's actually not maintaining. I think that that is part of building the structure. You may not be able to see it. It's like when you're seeing construction going on in the street, it's like, there's been a hole there for six months. What's going on? Well, they're putting in the plumbing and the electrical and all sorts of other stuff, which will be critical when the sides of the building go up. Same thing here, I think. And I'm going to ask two questions really quick and get go over to Elizabeth. But Robin, um, just because we are going to have a whole session on um, post merger integration. That, that's one of the topics we're going to dive hard into this. And I just want to ask Robin, um, you know, is it possible on the, from the HR perspective, um, is it possible to have and develop a really strong post integration strategy? Of course it is. Yes. Yes. And I would say, yeah, I think that's a little bit. Yeah, that's what I think what we've just been talking about, um, you know, culture communication, that's what can really make or break the value of a transaction. I think for both the seller, um, you know, seller having a plan kind of going into it, but then also the buyer. So I think the reason I say that is because, you know, and, and tell me if you guys agree, but 10 years ago, if I asked that question around culture, it was not, nobody cared. I mean, seriously, I, I just didn't see it like I see it today. I see it today where people are asking, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? They, I think people realize the importance around it, but I do believe when I started in this industry, it, it was barely talked about, not like it is today. Would you guys agree with, agree or disagree or? I absolutely agree. And I think the first, um, the first acquisition that that I did, just going back, thinking about kind of the bull in a china shop approach, we acquired a company that was outside of our kind of normal vertical, and we were just told, you know, go in there, interview everybody, like you tell them who we are and what we're going to do, and you see if they're going to be part of the team. Literally day one, and it was a disaster. I mean, it was in, in, in the long run, it was a successful acquisition, but the bull in a china shop approach just did not work, didn't work for their people. We lost some really good people and we used that in the next acquisition within the next six to 12 months to just, and I was leading the HR team at that point in time, but just to do something completely different. Um, you know, taking culture, not just our culture, right? But it's also the culture of the company that you're acquiring into consideration. Because let's face it, I mean, every acquisition, you're not gonna keep every employee. It's just not going to happen. I, I've never seen it done. There are employees that do need to exit. It's a tough thing to do because that can affect relationships. I saw it with my husband when he did the acquisition. There are people who had started that company and it, it was really a tough situation. So we are going to, just so everybody knows, that is what one of um, the next seminars is just that we're doing. It's diving in and creating what a template would look like and things to consider from our group here. But Elizabeth, I don't want to leave you out because you have a lot of experience in this. What are your thoughts before we dive into the last piece of this, the next six minutes? Okay, real quick, you know, there are different kinds of acquisition, right? You can acquire assets, you can acquire the entire company. Regardless, I have an 80-20 rule or maybe 70-30, you get the gist of it. I'm not really good with numbers, but you have a, the majority of the people that you want to retain. And then you have part that are, I call wobblers, you need to assess. And they're not just senior leaders, they're influencers too. They're people that could be mid-level or, or, or an employee. They're major influencers. And since, you know, we already know what the end state uh, of the culture you want, instead of trying to force people 
able to change, um, you know, when they're not the, you know, 80%, you must keep to protect your asset and when we competes and so forth. I need to look at, you know, what, who would you bring in and what kind of people you need to replace or what new roles you need to, um, you know, create. Uh, and you need to hire those people that fit the culture that you want, because that's much easier, because we just can't afford to distract the core business by a few people who just won't change their ways, you know? So, and this, I think, is um, important, no matter what kind of business you acquire and how you acquire it. And it's very uh, similar to actually, you know, contract transition as well. So that's that's why I wanted to add. And and uh, and thank you, because that... that um... It leads me to the last question that I'm going to throw out, and I'm, I'm going to say, and you're going to laugh when you hear this story. So, Susan, can you, there was a, a story that you shared with me once upon a time, and it, and I wrote it down, and it has to do with the two business owners that get, get together for dinner, right? And one's the seller, one's the buyer, and they're just kind of meeting. Tell, tell us that little story that you like to reference, and um, we'll wrap up here um, with one last question after that. Oh, uh, is this a story about the... Um about the two uh, business uh, owners, CEOs who got together for dinner to discuss a merger, bringing their businesses together. And by the way, I don't believe any there's ever been a, a real merger ever, but they were discussing a merger to bring their two teams together. And over dinner and a few glasses of wine, they, they agreed that one of the wonderful things was that the culture of their two companies was exactly alike. And this was going to be very easy to accomplish because the culture wasn't going to be a challenge. So, of course, um, you know, time went by and uh, they did actually uh, one acquire the other. And uh, and it, my team and I went to do some post merger integration work, which included, of course, up front employee surveys about the culture of their businesses, you know, the acquiring business and the acquired business. And of course, as we found out, the cultures were not really very much alike. <laughs> and we had a lot of work to do. So, I mean, the lesson there is just, you know, um, early in the process early in due diligence, really getting serious about what culture means and what, not just the words that we say, like, oh, it's a family business, but <laughs> we treat each other like family, but the behaviors that are expected and the, how the decisions are made, those things are what you have to dig into. And that'll tell you if your culture is the same or if it's not. And um, look, just like there are really no mergers, there are no two companies with an identical culture, but there are things about each company's culture that are worth keeping and finding a way to integrate for a successful merger. If I could add to that, Susan, sometimes the ownership thinks that there's one culture in the company and the employees think that there's a different culture. So when we're saying the culture, it's from whose perspective? Yes, that's exactly right. In fact, there may be the, 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 the owner or CEO may have something in, in their head about what they're trying to implement, and that's what they think the culture is. The leadership team may have a culture that's different than the rank and file. So yeah, culture, that's good. That's one of those things we can talk about a lot and one of the things that, of course, you know, Rebecca and her team know a ton about. Yes, thank you. Oh, that's a great place to end today. I know that we have some hard stops at one. I do want to say that is it for last last thought, is there besides culture, and I literally have this written down, what's the, the other o most overlooked red flag that someone needs to think about? Just real quick, we've got two minutes. Anybody want to throw anything out besides culture? It's honesty. People trying to spin a circumstance in the best possible light without actually being honest about what's going on. Every company has strengths and every company has challenges. And sellers who try and hide those challenges create a crack in the foundation that's going to be extremely hard to get past. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think it's a great place for us to to think that the next three will be diving into these topics really in depth. And and with you, this was more of an overview of what's to come. Obviously, we're going to focus on pre. Um, the pre-work, the post-work, and then also risk. Risk is a big one. So risk in the finance, we'll have we'll have one separate um, series just on that. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. I absolutely appreciate everything that you've brought to the table today. Um, I know every if anybody would like to reach out to any of the panelists, please you know email me and um, we'll get contacts made. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for our, to our participants, and we look forward to next month on the twentieth at the same time. Thank you and have a great afternoon, everyone.